every single Hello, this is YKN1111, and today we are going to go over every single free hard mode sword in 1.4 Terraria, and there's quite a lot to go through. There's so many, they won't even open my inventory. This is just one of the three categories I have set up, um, and I will get to that in a second. There's countless, uh, countless of them. Um, starting from things like, you have the wooden sword, and then everything from that to the Terragrim. Or Star Fury. Or just this. Um, yeah. So, let's get started. So, first, we have three categories that I split up into for this to go through. We have first the craftable swords, which are all in my inventory now. And then we have all ten of the short swords. And then we have all the swords that are not craftable or short swords and are going the other category and are obtained in other ways. So first, let's get started with the craftable swords. These are all swords that can be crafted and are not short swords. Yes, I know short swords are mostly craftable swords, but um, the way I organized it, short swords are their own category. They are an entirely different type of sword. And yeah, first we have the wooden sword. The wooden sword is made with seven wood at a workbench and tends to be the first sword that people go to to replace the copper short sword as it essentially just, my opinion at least, a stronger version of copper short sword except it's made of wood because it has not much more damage, only two more damage and it has the full normal sword rather than stabbing. I find this to be good at taking out um, enemies such as demon eyes as they generally fly at you from above for the most part and you just whack them, jump and whack them and that knocks them back pretty far as they have not much knockback resistance and because of just how they move around with their AI it's easy to knock them back fairly far, fairly quickly, especially when there's large numbers of them. I would, however, uh, advise against taking on large hordes of zombies with this. Um, it doesn't have the knockback needed. As you can see here, it has 7 base damage, 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and weak knockback. And the weak knockback is why exactly it's not good at uh, fighting off lots of zombies, because after a while, they will slowly and slowly get to you until they start to hit you. Especially bad if you are surrounded. Next, we have the Boreal Wood Sword. Now, the Boreal Wood Sword is essentially, you could consider it a direct upgrade of the Wooden Sword, because of... Uh, it is also a wooden sword, as you can probably guess by the name. And it is simply made with just a different type of wood. It is made with boreal wood, which is found in the snow biome by cutting down trees, or you could just find it as used to make the underground cabins in the underground snow biome. And yeah, it does more damage. Eight base damage, 4% critical strike chance, fast speed and average knockback. So it is stronger knockback, so better at crowd control because of the knockback. And as you can see, it does more damage. I'm gonna stick with one target dummy because, yeah, I don't think this looks too accurate if I'm hitting three. I mean, okay, yeah, are we, are we going to be hitting three of them? No, I don't think so. Next, we have the Rich Mahogany Sword. Now, the Oriole Wood Sword Rich Mahogany Sword and Palmwood Sword are not necessarily trio. When you look at their stats, they kind of are. Why, you ask? Because they have identical stats. All three of them have the same stats. So, 
see here, same damage, same 8 damage, 8 base damage, 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and average knockback. You see here, same with the Palmwood Sword. And it's just, they're just made of different types of wood. Boreal Wood for the Boreal Wood Sword. 7, Rich Mahogany at a workbench for the Rich Mahogany Sword. And 7 Palmwood at a workbench for the Palmwood Sword. That's all there is to it. Next, we have the Ebonwood Sword. Now, the Ebonwood Sword, as you can see right there, it is dealing more damage than the other swords. So, the Ebonwood Sword is made with 7 Ebonwood at a workbench. Ebonwood is obtained from cutting down the trees in the corruption. So, like, the purple trees in the corruption. If you see normal trees, that, that's not the corruption, but you're in the wrong spot. <laughs> so, um, the Ebonwood Sword has 10 base damage, 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and average knockback. So, it essentially has just slightly faster speed and slightly stronger knockback, but it's not enough to make it look different. It's like in the decimal points, essentially. And it deals two more damage, and early game, that, that really counts. Every point of damage that you can deal counts, especially if you're going to, like, if you're actually intending to venture the corruption. The enemies there can be quite strong early game. You do kind of need to have the defense you want against those enemies to survive. Now next, we have another situation like what we had with the Boreal Wood, Rich Mahogany, and Palmwood Swords. The Shadewood Sword, which is crafted with 7 Shade Wood at a workbench. Shade Wood is found in the trees in the Crimson by cutting them down. And, as you see here, it has the exact same stats as the Evan Wood Sword. No difference, just different type of wood. As you can see, the Shadewood Sword is a crimson counterpart to the Ebonwood Sword. Because the Corruption is the opposite of the Crimson. Next, we have the Cactus Sword. The Cactus Sword is made with 10 Cactus at a workbench. And I don't think I really need to explain where Cactus is found, but I think it's kind of obvious it's found in the desert. I mean, for you Terraria players, there you go. It is found in the desert, and you cut down cactus with an axe like a tree. And the cactus has 8 damage, 4% critical strike chance, slow speed, and average knockback. And as you can tell, it is quite slow. But, in this case with this sword, it actually makes it better, if you see what I mean. So. I can actually do this because it is a very large sword on top of being very slow. So look here. This actually is a great sword for crowd control. And if I'm not going strictly with a certain class other than melee, I tend to use this sword early game if I can. Because it is really, really good at hoarding off zombies. Hoarding them off. Because of the knockback, it pushes them back far enough. And with how slow the sword's animation is and how far of a reach it has. As you can see, I'm hitting three of them here. If I'm moving here, I can I can hit all four in one go, right there. And I don't even move too much. And very, very good against that, as it pushes them back and keeps hitting them. Okay, next we have the Copper Broadsword. The Copper Broadsword is the alternative to the Copper Short Sword as all of the lowest tier ores, the three lowest tiers, which would be copper, tin, iron, lead, silver, and tungsten, and gold and platinum, respectively. I will include the demonite and crimtain swords, but those are not the lowest three, just one tier up, and these two do not have short sword variants in vanilla terraria. And all these ones do. So, with all these ores, you can either make the short sword or the broad sword. These are the broad swords. They generally take one more bar of the metal 
that you're using to make the sword to make the sword. So here, the copper broadsword takes eight copper bars at an anvil to make. And it has eight damage, 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and average knockback. As you can see, I- oh, whoa, I can. It appears as if, if I time it correctly, I can also hit all four of them like that. That's interesting. So that is all there is for Copper Short Sword, the weakest of all the broad swords. Okay, next we have the Tin Broad Sword. The Tin Broad Sword is the next sword up from the Copper Broad Sword, and it deals one more damage, not which is nine damage, four percent critical strike chance, fast speed, and average knockback. This sword just is slightly stronger and as you can see yeah it does have slightly more speed but not by very much next we have the iron broadsword the iron broadsword is in the second weakest tier boards iron and lead and it does slightly more damage than the tin broadsword it does 10 damage 4% critical strike chance Fast speed and average knockback. And as you can see, it does deal more damage. I'm getting mostly 11s more than 10s. And that is all there is to the Iron Broadsword. Next, we have the Lead Broadsword. The Lead Broadsword is just a stronger version of the Iron Broadsword, essentially, as it is the counterpart to Iron dealing one more damage as usual and having slightly more speed and knockback by decimal points. Now here we have an interesting one here. Um, this is not something you would normally expect, but the Silver Broadsword has the exact same stats as the Lead Broadsword. All the numbers and everything are the exact same. As you can see, it's dealing the exact same amount of damage, and there is nothing else to it. The only difference is that it is made with eight silver bars, for example, rather than eight lead bars. All these swords are made with eight of their respective metal bars at an anvil. Sorry if I forgot to say that earlier for the other swords. My bad. Okay, next we have the Tungsten Broadsword. The Tungsten Broadsword is the stronger variant of the Silver one, as it is the alternative, alternative to Silver, dealing 12 damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed and average knockback. As you can see, it is actually faster. Rather than fast speed, it is very fast. And as you can see, it is most definitely faster dealing a lot more damage. I'm getting I'm getting almost I'm getting almost 80 damage per second just by walking through these gummies. I, no, I just went to 81. So, I got it to 81 there. And so it's fairly decent, very early game. Likewise with all the others. Made with eight tungsten bars at an anvil. Next, we have the gold broadsword. The gold broadsword is made with eight gold bars at an anvil and has 13 damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, and average knockback. As you can see, it is actually faster than the tungsten one, as you can see. Not by very much, but it is a noticeable difference. And now we have the Platinum Broadsword, the last of the lowest tier swords made of the lowest tier ores. And it is made with eight platinum bars at an anvil, and it has 15 melee damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, and average knockback. As you can see, it deals a decent amount of damage. I'm, I'm getting up to a lot of damage here. Here. I'm getting up to, I'm getting up to, yeah, I just, I just hit 100 there. So I'm getting 
I can get up to like about 100 damage per second on just four target dummies here. Of course, I don't. <laughs> unless you have a cobalt shield, you probably can't do this with normal enemies. Um, yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't think you'd be using a platinum broadsword. Um, at that stage of the game, if you're using a platinum broadsword post Galatron, please, please, please use your brain. Get a better sword. Next, we have the Light Spain. The Light Spain is typically the first sword a player will get after they first defeat a boss, assuming the first boss they defeat is the Eye Cthulhu, as you need Demonite to make the sword. You need 10 Demonite bars, compared to the normal 8, you need 10 Demonite bars at an anvil to make it. And it has 17 damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, average knockback. And it is also material to make the Knight's Edge, which is a very powerful late pre hard mode sword. As you can see, it has decent damage. And I don't know if the sword's normally this large. It's larger than I remember. I think it's a 1.4 thing. Or it might be because my uh, main journey mode world is, um, is the Drunk World Seed. That may be part of it. Someone please tell me. Um, I'm uncertain as to why, because I remember the sword being about half the size of what it normally is. Someone please tell me in comments. I, <laughs> I did not see anything on this when I first looked it up with 1.4 updated on the wiki. I would like to know. Next, we have the Blood Butcherer. So Blood Butcherer is the crimson counterpart to the Lightsbane as it is made with, instead of demonite bars, it is made with 10 Fremtane bars at an anvil. And it's stronger than the Light Spain by quite a bit. As you can see, it does a lot more. And it deals 22 damage, has 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and average knockback. So it does have slower speed, but it does go get more damage as it tends to hit more enemies, as we have seen that with slower speed. That's all there is to the Blood Butcherer, but it is also used as an alternative to the Light Spain in making the Knight's Edge, as it is Crimson Counterpart. Because in Crimson World, you can't get the Light Spain, and then vice versa, and that's all there is to it. Next, we have uh, one of my favorite ones, even though I don't really use it, I find it very interesting. And that is the Phase Blades. Um, all of these are the same. It is just a matter of what color you want it to be. So to make it, you need 15 meteorite bars and 10 of any type of gem, depending on what color you want it to be. For the purple Phase Blade, you need 10 amethysts. For the yellow one, you need 10 topaz. For the blue one, you need 10 sapphires. For the green one, you need 10 emeralds. For the red one, you need 10 rubies. For the white one, you need 10 diamonds. And for the orange one, you need 10 amber. So as you see here, it's just a matter of which one you want. All these have the same exact stats. None of them are auto fire or auto swing. So it's just a matter of what color you want or what gems you have available. Generally, for blue, if I do, Using, I'm probably gonna go with blue because why? That's my favorite color. I love the sword. I don't really use it. I don't really ever have the gemstones to spare to make it. If you've seen my playthroughs, um, so yeah, I would recommend trying to get the sword if you're going like strictly melee or you want to have some fun with like your friends, with, like lightsaber related stuff. If she breathes, she's the star! As you probably guess by the sound effect of the sound of the sword being swung, and that yeah, is Star Wars reference there. And yeah, that is all there is to the phase blades. Next is the blade of grass. Now the blade of grass is one of the four swords used to make the Knight's Edge, and this sword requires you to spend some time in the underground jungle to get it. 
and do quite a bit of exploring there, as it requires you to have jungle spores. To make it, you need 12 jungle spores and 12 stingers. So jungle spores are like glowing spores in the underground jungle. You find them generally a bit deeper down, rather than in the cavern layer, rather than underground. But I think they can also spawn in the underground layer, just small numbers normally. And the stingers can be dropped from either hornets or spiked slimes, which are some of the most annoying enemies there, especially spiked jungle slimes. They can be especially deadly in X mode as they shoot spikes at you in several directions in X mode. And on top of that, they inflict you with poison for quite a long time. X mode is for like 40 seconds. So be careful trying to get the sword. The sword is probably the most painful one to get out of all the components used to make the Knight's Edge. And that is... no wait, no, not, not all there is. My bad, my bad memory. Um, 28 damage, 4% critical strike chance, average speed, very weak knockback, and yes, it is material for the Knight's Edge and it can poison enemies. As you can see here, the, the you see, you see those ones that's from the poison. Again, it's good at hitting everything. This sword apparently can hit all four of the dummies. And that's pretty neat. Big swords that deal lots of damage and hit poison are always going to be pretty useful. Especially considering you only need an anvil to make the sword. You only need the 12 jungle spores and skingers and an anvil to make it. It is quite simple to get. And if you're willing to explore the jungle, perhaps slightly underprepared and die a lot, then you will have this sword in no time, and you will just destroy pre-hard mode. Okay, early pre-hard mode. The sword is not the best for late pre-hard mode or bosses due to its slower speed, but it can still land hits due to its larger size. Next, we have the Fiery Great Sword. The Fiery Greatsword is made with 20 Hellstone Bars at an anvil. So this one requires you to go down to hell with a Nightmare or Deathbringer pickaxe or better. And you have to get 20 Hellstone Bars, which would be 60 Hellstone Ore and 20 Obsidian. And that is all you would need to get the Hellstone Bars, assuming you already have a Hellforge from searching. And so the sword is quite strong, provides a fair bit of light as well. And it, as you can tell from here, it is not only a, an insanely large sword, as you can see, it's like almost twice the size of my character. And it's dealing a ton of damage, just hitting all of these dummies and it's setting them all on fire. Yes, this sets enemies on fire. And it's dealing almost like 250 damage per second on all four of these. It's like on one, we're getting about actually almost even 100. Okay, we were about at 100. It went up to 80. And it has 36 damage, 4% critical strike chance, average speed, and strong knockback. And it is one of the four swords needed to make the Knight's Edge. That's all there is to the Fiery Greatsword. Oh, hello there! I'm just here on the Corruption now. You know why? Because there's something very significant about these Demon Altars here found in the Corruption. Or Crimson Altars in the Crimson for this next one. Because for this, you need the Mermassa, Fiery Greatsword, Blade of Grass, and the Lightsbane or Blood Butcher, which have you, these two, these two, you decide which one of these you use. You don't have to use both of them, so it's technically these four, but if you don't have the Light Spang, because Crimson World, you also use Blood Butcher. And you make the Knight's Edge at a Demon Altar here. I'm not going to use the one the modifier, because that's going to change how it works. And by 
place down some target dummies, we can see here just how strong this sword is. This sword not only provides a fair bit of light, but it is capable of hitting at least three target dummies at once, dealing over 200 damage per second. With 42 base damage, 4% critical strike chance, average speed, and average knockback. And this sword is material to make the True Knight's Edge with a Broken Hero Sword and a Mithril slash or Calcium Anvil in hard mode. After mech bosses being, I know after all three mech bosses have been defeated, because it does require that you have Broken Hero Sword as well. But this is known to be the most powerful pre-hard mode sword in all of Terraria, requiring quite a decent crafting tree to make, and it is part of a rather big crafting tree that it leads up to on its own, and that would be the Zenith. But that's post-Moon Lord. So yeah, we're skipping to pre-hard mode for now, so let's not get into that just yet. Okay, that was all I had for the swords. Now, we have the short swords. And as you can see, what I'm going over first here is the all-famous weakest sword in the entire game, the copper short sword. Now, the copper short sword has 5 base damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, and weak knockback. The very fast speed is to wake it, make up for a short range and low damage. As you can see here, a critical strike gives it 10 damage, or 12. Sure you can hit two dummies, but you have to be standing right on top of the first one. Oh no, you can hit three. You, you can hit three. Actually, no, the, the first one is only getting hit half the time. That's... I don't know why that's the case, but I'm interested to find out why. Um, that is all there is to the Copper Short Sword. However, it is also material to use. The ze to make the Zenith, which is the most powerful sword in the entire game. However, post Moon Lord, we're going over that in another video. Next, we have the Tin Short Sword. The Tin Short Sword is like the Copper Short Sword. Slightly more powerful, dealing just as much damage as the Wooden Sword, rather than 5 damage, which the Copper Short Sword has. So it has slightly stronger stats, which includes 7 damage instead of 5, 4% critical strike chance, and and very fast speed, weak knockback. Of course, there is slightly stronger of each of knockback and speed, however, it's very slight, and you only notice it by looking at it on the Terraria wiki. And likewise, with the Copper Short Sword, it is made with, uh, what is it, made with 7 10 bars, at an anvil. Just the same instead of seven copper bars at an anvil slash starter weapon. If you ask me personally, I would say that this should be the starting weapon for worlds that contain tin instead of copper. I think that would make it a bit more interesting for gameplay, but uh, I don't have control on that. <laughs> but I, I, I'm kind of interested to see what that would be like. Now we have the iron short sword. Iron Short Sword is made with seven iron bars at an anvil. And it has eight damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, and weak knockback. As you can see, it does in fact deal more damage. I'm actually getting about 30 damage per second with this. So as you can see, yeah, it's pretty fast. I'm clicking as fast as I can. Yeah, it's not too fast, but it is very fast compared to how normal swords swing. And that's all there is to the Iron Short Sword. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's get started on another interesting situation here. Remember how the Lead and Silver Broadswords had the same stats? Well, guess what? That is the same case here. As you can see, 9 damage, 4% critical strike chance. Very fast speed and weak knockback. Dealing about 30 damage per second here. 
looks like the silver sword sword might have a shorter animation. Cause look. And then, you barely see this. You can barely see this sword, it's so fast. The animation. It's like, flash. It's like you blink and you don't see it. Um, this one you can see for a bit longer. I think that's why. Uh, this one appears to be attacking faster. This was not the case with the broadswords. That's very interesting. So I would note that. I would, I would take that into account when deciding which one of these two swords you want. If that's what you're dealing with in the early game. If you are deciding to use short swords. Next on the list of swords is the Pungston Short Sword. Pungston Short Sword has 10 damage. 4% critical threat chance, very fast speed, and weak knockback. As you can see, it is, in fact, faster and deals more damage. On a single target, I'm dealing almost 50 damage per second here. Although, um, clicking like this for a while, spamming it like this for a while, it, it starts to hurt your finger, your hand, after a while. As that is what is happening to me now, <laughs> because I am messing around with short swords too much. That is the only downside to them. They are good at short range like this if you're dealing with enemies that don't have 100% knockback resistance and don't move too fast, which is <laughs> most enemies would do better against short sword than you would think. Um, yeah. So that is all there is to the Tongskin Short Sword. It is made with seven, no, six Tongskin bars and an anvil. Strangely, it is uh, crafted with one less than for the rest of it. That's the weird thing. I don't know why they did that with silver and Tongskin, but that's just a bit odd if you ask me. After the Tongskin Short Sword, we have the Gold Short Sword much stronger. On a single target, I'm dealing 50 damage per second, roughly. I'm hitting almost 60 at, at its best. As you can see, I went up to 58. And it has 12 damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, and average knockback. So it is actually much more knockback than other short swords, than the copper short sword especially. Um, slightly more than the tungsten one, but just enough so that it shows as more than that. Because it is average knockback instead of weak. I don't know why they did that, but it's good that they make it strong and powerful. Because he doesn't want to mess around with short swords a little bit every now and then. <laughs> it's fun to just stab the target dummy. As you can see, I'm, I'm having a little bit too much fun there. Um, yeah, so that is all there is for the gold short sword. Next is the platinum short sword. The platinum short sword is the last of the lowest tier ores for short swords. And as you can see here, it deals a lot more damage. I saw it go up to almost 80 a second ago. Look at how fast. I'm clicking as fast as I can right now. Actually, no. No, that's slower. Just using, uh, using my laptop and I'm seeing if the mouse pad would be faster. Just to see. Nope, I'm wrong. It's faster like this. So yeah, I actually almost wanted to do 100 damage per second there. So I'm, like, in the 60s to 100s. Just can see I'm in 70s in damage per second there. And it has 13 damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, and average knockback. Yeah, very, very fast. Look how fast it is. That it only hits once each time you use it. So if I just spam it like this, I can deal a crap ton of damage. Look at that. That's pretty good for short swords, especially. That's all there is to it. Now here we have the one short sword you never expected to be a short sword because pre 1.4 is an accessory, and that is the ruler. That's right, the ruler is now a short sword. Deal with it. It is actually very strong for a short sword. Look at that, I'm getting a lot of damage. 
I'm, if I'm getting three here, I'm, I'm getting nearly 200 damage per second. I'm, I passed 200 damage per second. I was like at 210 to 220. Look at this. You know why it's so strong? Because it can hit faster because it actually hits multiple times per animation. So that's, I believe, four. Yes, yeah, so that's like roughly four. And so it does 12 damage and has 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, and extremely weak knockback. It is very extremely weak knockback. If you look on the Terraria Wiki, it actually only has like 0.5 knockback. So it's not gonna do much to stop enemies from getting to you, but it will kill them rather quickly with how fast it attacks. Look at all those numbers. That is insane. So it is the only short sword that is auto swing in vanilla Terraria. And you can buy from the Goblin Tinkerer for 10 silver. So the price is being reduced from like one gold to a base price of 10 silver in 1.4. I'm saying base price because of how NPC happiness works. Lastly, for the short swords, we have the Gladius. The Gladius is a brand new addition to 1.4. And it has the most damage out of them. However, like I said, the rule is dealing with auto swing. So if I go here, it will deal roughly about as much damage as the ruler. It goes up. Okay, never mind. It does more. Um, it does hit multiple times per swing. Hits two, three times about. And it also, as you can see, it has just about the longest range of the short swords. So I can hit it. I can hit it from over here. You can't do that with the other sources, you have to be like right here. This one you can you can you can hit from right there. That's quite a distance, that's a few blocks. It's like two, three blocks of a distance there. That's pretty good for a short sword. So it has 15 damage, 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and extremely weak knockback. It does have the same knockback as the ruler so it's 0.5 so it's not much knockback at all but it does deal the most damage as you can see i can't really display it on only one target because it's kind of hard to not hit the second one if i do it from back here it's not gonna hit every single time um or i think i don't know yeah nah it's hitting every time now it is i got the right spot so there we go as you can see, it does actually occasionally hit the second one. So that's actually really good. That's, in my opinion, the strongest short sword. And yeah, that's all there is for short swords. Next, we have the other swords. These ones are swords that are not short swords and cannot be crafted. This is Alaska. Three categories I split all the pretty hard mode swords into. So you have everything from the Staff of Regrowth. And then you have everything from that to Star Fury. Lots of interesting swords here. These ones tend to have special abilities that other swords do not have. And does many different things that other swords do not have the abilities to do. So first, for other swords, we have the Staff of Regrowth. As you can see here, it doesn't do very much damage. It does some. I'm dealing like almost 50 damage per second on three of them, but on one, I'm dealing barely 30. And so, strangely, this is actually not classified as a sword on the Terraria Wiki, and neither is the Sickle. Um, they're classified as tools. I can kind of see why, because the main intent of these two items are not necessarily to be swords. However, I'm keeping them here 
in this tutorial here, because they act like swords here, it has the exact same kind of animation as the sword, it has all the capabilities to be used as an actually fairly decent um, early game sword. And come on, who hasn't used the, the sickle as a like early game weapon in the current versions of the game? It is actually really good if you have the extra 60 silver. So the scap regrowth um, can grow grass on dirt. So if I go down here, it, it can grow grass. It grows brand new grass. Okay. Oh no. Oh. I can't get out of this. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. That was that was not good. <laughs> so yeah, it just grows stuff. It can also be used to um, increase alchemy plant collection. Rule one: used to gather alchemy plants or herbs. So that'd be day bloom, blink root, shiver thorn, fire blossom, death weed, and moon glow. I think I'm- no, I didn't miss any. So yeah, that's all there is to that. That is the main intent of this quote-unquote sword. Also tool. And that is the main intention of it. Most people use it to grow grass and stuff like that. For builds or for alchemy, plant gathering, stuff of that nature. Next, we have the sickle. The sickle allows the collection of hay from grass. So if I go down here, it will start giving me hay when I break grass. But if I use anything else, you'll see, okay, you'll see it just doesn't give me any hay, because grass normally doesn't. But once I pull out the sickle, it starts giving me hay. And hay can be used for some building, you can make walls out of it. And you can also use it um, to make these target dummies here. With 50 hay and some wood at a sawmill, you can make target dummies, just like these. And it has 9 damage, 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and very weak knockback. So, one of the greatest things about this being used as an early, very early game weapon is not really because of damage. There's better weapons and better damage than this accessible as early on, if not earlier on, than the sickle. Because sickle, you need to buy for base price of 60 silver from the merchant. Whereas the scaff regrowth is found in ivy chests in the underground jungle jungle shrines or living mahogany trees this is auto swing and so is the staff of regrowth and that is why it can be such a good melee weapon very early on if you decide to use it as a melee weapon the only downside would be that you might uh, like if you're using it while exploring you're probably gonna pick up an annoyingly large amount of hay if you <laughs> it's probably gonna be annoying if you don't want it but if you want to make, like, actual builds out of it, I recommend just using it as early game weapon. Just kind of as an excuse to just have so much hay. Just for building, if that is what you want hay for. It's actually hitting all four of the targets, I mean, it's here. So it has decent range, both behind you, up around here, and out. And see, I'm actually like this, I'm dealing almost 100 damage per second. And that is all there is for the sickle. Now, this next one is very similar to a certain drop from the, um, the Crimson Mimic. That I cannot pronounce the Flooded Backnads, or I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. <laughs> I apologize if I pronounced it horribly wrong. But, um, I would say that this here, the Bladed Glove, is essentially the pre-hard mode version of that. While the, yes, the bladed glove did exist before that, before the party back nads, 
that draw from Crimson Mimics occasionally. Um, this one behaves the exact same way. Look at this. So I'm dealing very large amounts of damage. I'm dealing over 200 damage per second here with a weapon that doesn't even have that much base damage. It only has 12 damage, 4% critical strike chance, and it does have very insanely fast speed and weak knockback. Insanely fast speed, I think you can tell. It's like, it's so fast, you just click once, and because it is auto swing, you just hold it down for like half a second more instead of just clicking it. If you hold it down for like more than half a second, it'll like already have swung like four times. So like, uh, let's see. One. One. That's one second, and you're taking like six times. So you're dealing like 60 damage in one second. <laughs> At least. And you can deal more if there's multiple targets. Yes. Huh. Here's if I keep turning like this. It keeps going up a bit farther. I think I got up to 220. So that is insane. So this was only um, obtained by being dropped by weak enemies during the Halloween season. So that is either during the normal Halloween season, like October 15th to 31st, or for the first in-game day after you have defeated a pumpkin moon. So you like, we reach wave 15, and then that next in-game day, you will get Halloween enemies showing up, it will drop goodie bags and all that stuff, and weaker enemies will drop the bladed glove, rarely. It is a rare drop, but it is very powerful, and if you are in the early game, and you so happen to be playing in, like, the second half of October, I would HIGHLY recommend that you get this. Just grind for it, and have it. You see me, um, if, if you've seen, like, my um, playthrough on the Xbox One version, I just completely shredded the Destroyer, I was underprepared, and I just took this into the fight. And I shredded it. Like, I just shredded it. Died. Okay. So, on that note, that is all I have for the Bladed Glove. Next, we have... Back to normal weaker swords. Sort of. We have... Zombie Arm. Which has a 0.4% chance to drop from zombies. So it is a fairly rare drop. It has 12 damage. 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and average knockback. Unlike the previous three, this is not auto swing. It is not very strong. Um, it is useful if you get an early game before you get like any decent swords. Like um, Light Spain or Blood Butcher. This would be like temporary replacement. But typically, I would prefer the Cactus Sword over it due to the Cactus Sword's larger size and ability to hit enemies more, and more range. Because this sword, look, this sword is like, only is about as much range as the Gladius Short Sword. Which, as you can imagine, that's not as much range as you kind of want in a normal sword, or rod sword in other words. So, uh, that's all there is for the zombie arm. Next, we have something very similar to the Mandible Blade, but it is kind of stronger by a little bit, and it's auto swing, and that is the Mandible Blade. The Mandible Blade has a 2% chance to be dropped by any Antlion Chargers and Antlion Swarmers, meaning the giant ones or the normal ones, or so I would prefer to say the normal size ones and then the miniature ones. The giant ones are just how they look like a 1.3. But the important thing is here that 14 melee damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, and average knockback. So it is essentially, if you think about it, it is just a stronger variant of the zombie arm, 
except you have to kill slightly, well no, very much more powerful enemies to get it. However, um, it's not too difficult to kill the enemies that brought this because of how the structure of the underground desert works. All you have to do is, um, because of how there's like a lot of small pockets in the underground desert, not very many big areas, you just need to be careful wandering around. And if you see them, you can attack them safely from a distance, especially the chargers, because the airline chargers cannot fit through a uh, two block wide hole. It's like, um, here this is two blocks wide. I can fit through there. An airline charger won't be able to fit through there. That's just an example of the width. So it, it can go through like four block wide holes in the ground. Um, so yeah, just keep an eye out for that. And it is quite strong early game. Next, we have the Bone Sword. The Bone Sword is a rare early game sword that is rarely dropped by skeletons and has a 0.49% chance to be dropped by any skeletons that you find on the ground. As you can see here, it does somewhat decent damage, however it is not auto swing, but kind of makes up for that in the range. Um, it has 16 damage, 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and average knockback. So here we have, it can actually hit three of them. Can't really hit four of them though, because of how fast it is, sadly. Thought that'd be fun to try. And yeah, that is all there is to the Bone Sword. Not much to it, not very powerful. Not often seen because of how rare it is. Next, we have the Candy Cane Sword. The Candy Cane Sword is kind of like, I'd say, the Christmas counterpart to the Halloween Bladed Glove. However, it's no, it is not dropped by weak enemies during the Christmas event. It is from the Christmas event, though. Um, during the Christmas event, December 15th to December 31st, or for the first in-game day after you have defeated a Pumpkin Moon, meaning reached Wave 15, um, enemies will start to drop presents, and the Candy Cane Sword has a 0.6% chance to be dropped by presents when you open them. Now, the Candy Cane Sword is decent, as it has rather large size, and decent range for hitting enemies, which is quite important early game if you going up against highly resistant to knockback enemies. Um, and then it has 16 base damage, 4% critical strike chance, average speed, and average knockback. So it's average kind of sword, I guess. But it is decent damage and does have a large range. There's one way I think the sword can improve. If it was auto swing, that would make it just like the katana almost, but from Christmas. I think that'd be pretty cool. Okay, next we have the katana. The katana is a very strong sword early game. As you can see, it's actually able to be obtained right at the very start of the game, as it was sold by the traveling merchant. It is sold occasionally by the Traveling Merchant for 10 gold. And Katana has 16 damage, 19% critical strike chance, fast speed, and weak knockback. The reason why this sword is so powerful is because of how early on you can get it. You can get it right at the very start of the game, as long as you have at least two NPCs moved into a house for the purpose of the Traveling Merchant moving in. Well, um, arriving for the duration of the day, and 10 gold to buy the sword itself, which can be easily done if you have the merchant and you catch a golden critter and sell it, because that sells for 10 gold. And so the reason why it's powerful is because it's auto swing, and it's very high critical strike chance for an early game weapon. 
by a very large amount, by insanely large amount. It has the highest critical strike chance out of every single pre-hard mode sword in Terraria. 19% critical strike chance, and next up would be the Ice Blade with 6% critical strike chance. All the other ones have 4% critical strike chance. This, of course, can be increased with accessories and melee armor. However, most melee armor does not increase critical strike chance until later on in the game. That's all there is to the katana. Next is a very powerful sword, another very powerful sword, and that is the Ice Blade. The Ice Blade is one of the primary items found in frozen chests and the underground snow biome. They are ice chests, but they have been renamed Frozen Chests in 1.4 update, for those of you who are confused. They are also found in boreal and frozen crates from fishing in the snow biome. Which are the fishing crates that are for the snow biome. And here... We have a lot of damage. So, this shoots Icy Bolt. And, um... So it can only shoot one um, every 1.5 seconds. So if I keep swinging, it can only shoot one every 1.5 seconds. And as you can see, it deals a bit less damage than the sword itself, but pretty much about the same damage. So the Icy Blade has 17 base damage, 6% critical strike chance, very fast speed, average knockback, and it shoots an Icy Bolt like that. Like the ice ball guys cocked by the second go of the projectile. Um, and it is auto swing, which makes it very useful. And because it has range capabilities as well, you can actually fight some bosses with this. Like, you could take the I Cthulhu on with this. It may take a while, but if you can land every single hit, if you have good aim, you can, you can take it on. At least in normal mode. I don't know about extra mode. Most likely not in extra mode because of how much faster the Eye Cthulhu is, and how much more health it has. Because after all, this sword does have 17 damage. And on top of that, the Icy Bolt that I shot out does provide a small amount of light. So if I am to go here again... So here provides light, and so does the sword itself. And the light still lingers a little while after the, um, the icy wall itself is destroyed. That is all there is to the icy bolt. Next up is the Purple Clubberfish. The Purple Clubberfish has a 1 in 50 chance to be caught with 50% fishing power when you are fishing in the corruption. With, of course, greater chances to catch it with greater fishing power. As you can see, it is a rather large sword that is very slow, but can deal decent damage. And, on top of that, it is auto-swing. However, you cannot turn around while doing this, so as you can see... I, 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 I walk backwards like this. Which can be helpful in some situations. But of course, because of how slow it is, you can easily just... Okay, if you if you don't wait until after the sword stops swinging, though, um, it will keep forcing you to walk backwards like that. As you can see. Um, so it has 24 damage, 4% critical strike chance, slow speed, and strong knockback. It is very strong, well not very strong knockback, but it is quite strong knockback for especially an early game sword of all things, having 7 knockback, which is quite strong. The line for strong knockback is 
um, is put at like um, 6.5, I think is 6.5 to something is strong. I don't remember where it's strong and insane knockback or put for in terms of knockback. But it is decent knockback, decent damage. However, it does require that you go fishing in the corruption for some time. Because with 50% fishing power, it's 1 in 50 chance. And chances are, you don't have 50% fishing power when you're going to want to have this weapon. And that is all there is for the purple club of fit. Next up is the beekeeper. And you're probably wondering why am I not back over there? Over there? Um, the reason is because... Um, apparently, the main feature of the Beekeeper does not work on the target dummies. That is, it summons bees when you hit him, when you hit an enemy. It also has a 90% chance to confuse an enemy when you hit it. So as you can see, it is summoning bees, and the bees act like just essentially the same as the bees from the bee gun. And they do, the bees do get damage benefits, and you get stronger, and more bees are summoned when um, the world is an expert mode world. It is not boosted further in master mode, unfortunately, but, um, so it just summons more bees and they do more damage in expert mode. And as you can see, the confusion debuff is confusing the human cords, making them run away from the bees. So, um, this has a 1 in 3 chance to drop from the Queen Bee. I think I should turn off this before some of my NPCs die. Um, so yeah, it has 24 damage, 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and average knockback, and is material. Um, for the Zenith. One of the 10 swords needed to make the Zenith. And so, yes, it summons killer bees after striking your foe. And the last part is actually quite incorrect, because it's a small chance to cause confusion. No, it's a 9% chance. That's a, that's a good chance, too. That's like 9 out of 10 times you hit an enemy, it will inflict the enemies with confusion, as you can see. We're... These are these are journey modes. They're, they're half as powerful as normal mode unicorns. But you get the idea. They're, the idea is not how fast can kill even horns, the idea is how fast, not how fast, how, how well does it do with the bees and the confusion. So it is not auto swing, but um, it is quite decent, and is the only problem is that you have to kill the queen bee to get it, and it's, it is one in three chance. Uh, with the other two items being the bees and knees and the bee gun. And that is all there is for the... the, um, the next is the Muramasa. Very well known. Being here since the beginning of the game. Likewise with Star Fury. And... It is a post-skeletron weapon found in the dungeon in locked gold chests. It is auto swing, provides some light when it is being used. Has 21 damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, and very weak knockback. And it is material for the Knight's Edge as, as, as I have gone over that earlier. And I'm dealing about 300 damage per second on four target dummies here. I just... Yeah, it went up to above 300 per second there. So, very strong. Um, because it is auto swing and because of its fast speed, it can actually combat the Knight Edge, Knight's Edge a bit because of that and that alone. However, the Knight's Edge does have more damage, has twice the amount of damage exactly as the Mermassa. So, take that into account, decide which one you want. You're probably going to go with Knight's Edge. But yeah, on versions not 3DS version or mobile, it is, it is, Night's Edge is not always swing, so be aware of that, just so you know. 
Um, that's all there is for the Mermasa. Now we have the Star Fury. The Star Fury is a fairly strong early game weapon that is found in Skyware chests in Sky Islands. Like this. Although the uh, Sky Islands are not snow bombs, so sorry, it's the wrong world seed. Um and it has 22 base damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, average knockback, and is material to make the Zenith. So this sword makes stars fall from the sky when swung. And the stars themselves that fall, they have a base damage of twice the base damage of the sword, which is the sword is 22, the stars do 44 base damage. As you can see, it just did 100. Um, however, this sword does have limited capabilities underground, because... Let's see, if I swing it here, you see it gets destroyed upon hitting any solid block. And the underground is full of those everywhere. Especially above you, and below you, and to the left and right. So, of course, you can still hit with the sword itself, but it would be quite difficult to try to hit an enemy and aim it properly underground. And that is all there is to the Scar Fury. Next up is the Enchanted Sword. Everyone here knows this sword, right? I think everyone does. This is a fairly strong early game sword that is found in sword shrines, or as of 1.4, is also found in gold and titanium fishing crates. Titanium crates being the hard mode variant of the golden crate, added in 1.4. This sword has 23 damage, 4 percent critical strike chance, fast speed, average knockback, and is material to make the zenith. And it shoots a sword beam. Similar to the ice sea bolt from the ice blade. That is, that is shot out by the ice blade. This shoots out sword, um, a sword beam that goes out and hits enemies. However, it is one second, I believe, rather than 1.5. I'll, I'll count. 1,000. One 1,000. Let's see. That's. So that's one second, and it's exactly after that, the next projectile got shot out from the sword. So that is exactly one second. I can deal fairly decent damage to this as well, as you can see I'm doing roughly, like, 250, rhyme like this. And it's auto-swing, which makes it even better. And here, I'm, I'm dealing, like, 50 damage per second. 30 to 50. And, um, a single enemy, I'm dealing almost 100. I'm dealing almost 100. I'm like, yeah, I just went over 100. See exactly 100. And that is all there is for the enchanted. Next is the stylish scissors. The stylish scissors have a 12.5% chance to drop from the stylus when the Skylist is killed. Not not the not the web Skylist, just the actual Skylist after you free the Skylist from being stuck in cobwebs in the spider nest. Like I'm very afraid of going in. Um so it has 14 damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed and average knockback. So this is also, the weapon that the stylist uses to defend herself from harm from enemies. So as you can see here, on three target dummies, I'm dealing almost, I've gone up to almost 200 damage per second. And that is all there is to the Skylar Scissors. Um, uh, interesting melee weapon. Want to use scissors to slice up your enemies? Uh, sure, go ahead, I'm not gonna judge you. Next up is the Exotic Scimitar. 
The exotic scimitar is essentially the same thing as the style of the scissors, except it is dropped by the die trader at a 12.5% chance, rather than the Skylist. I'm just talking about that, not, not, they're not actually the same at all. They're two entirely different melee weapons. But I'm just pointing out that they both drop from NPCs. I could have worded that better. So it has 20 base damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed and average knockback. So this is obviously Die Trader. Die Trader uses this to defend himself from enemies. So I'm dealing decent damage. It has more damage than I'm dealing, roughly 150 or so on 4 target dummies like that. And that's all I have for Zodic Scimitar. It's a cool melee weapon, it does roughly about as much damage as the Mermasa. That's all there is to that. Next, we have the Falcon Blade. The Falcon Blade has a 6.25% chance to be dropped from iron and mithril crates when they are open. And it has 25 base damage, 4% critical strike chance, very fast speed, and average knockback. And it is fairly decent considering the fact that it is auto swing, and you can get it right at the start of the game. All you need is you need to have gotten merchant for the purpose of bug net because fishing. But it's worth it for the 25 silver that you get, trust me, because fishing crates not only get you this, they get you a lot of potions and a lot of money as well. And yeah, so this is a fairly decent sword, as you can see. The only um, bad part is that not, not as much range, I can't even hit three at a time. But I'm getting roughly 150 damage per second like this. And even now, I was, I was close to 100. And that is all there is for the Falcon. And the last sword today, we have the Terragrim, the uh, not not as well liked version of the Arcalis, replacing the Arcalis as an enchanted sword shrine drop in the 1.4 update. And this is one of the rarest swords in all of 1.4 Terraria. Why, you ask? Because they made enchanted sword shrines like a thousand times more painful to find. They only now have a 1 in 3 chance of spawning with the uh, 1 block wide hole that leads down to it. And they're not even guaranteed to show up in any Terraria world ever. Except for maybe some world seats, but that's entirely different. Like it, like it used to be in 1.3, you had a guaranteed 3 sword shrines, whether they were real shrines or not. You would have 3 sword shrines in a medium-sized world. That's not a thing anymore. You just find them randomly. You have to really search for it, because it can be anywhere. Because not only does the uh, background furniture object that drops the enchant sword and slash teragram um, show up in sword shrines, but it also rarely shows up in the cavern layer. And the reason why this makes it so annoying to get the Terragrim, is because the Terragrim only has a 1 in 50 chance of being dropped by the Sword Shrines. I mean, you have to find, like, 50 of them. Or you can use a trick, um, that would involve you, um, find the Sword Shrine, breaking it, and if it doesn't give you the Terragrim, you, um, like, press Alt F4, and force close Terraria, reopen it, and keep breaking the Sword Shrine until it gives you the Terragrim. And, yeah, as you can see, it is insanely powerful. We are at like, 3-4 times the amount of DPS that we've already hit before. Okay, not really, we're nearing 3 times, kind of. <laughs> as you can see, we're, we're well in the 600s. So it has 17 base damage, 4% critical strike chance, fast speed, and very weak knockback. That is made up for... So it does hit multiple times in one hit. As you can see, it's hitting like two, three times. 
and here, even on one target, we are over 200 damage per second because of how insane fast it is. And you can also aim it, aim where you want it to be um, striking enemies, like you can aim it to your cursor, like this, kind of like how you now can to short sword of 1.4, and it, um, it did replace the Arcalis, but as you can see here, the Arcalis still exists in the game, but you know why, you know why you can't get it from short signs anymore? Because it has been made part of the Arcalis developer set. Which now means that not only is the arcade list no longer available in Sword Shrines, but it is now not only a hard mode exclusive item, but it's also expert slash master mode exclusive, as developer sets have a, only a 5% chance to drop from expert mode treasure bags that are from hard mode bosses. Like any boss that you can't fight until after you at beating the wall of flesh for the first time. So yeah. Very strong. As you can tell. Um and that is all there is for that. The Arcalis is just slightly stronger, as you can see. It's gonna have 17 damage. Uh very weak knockback. It is 20 damage and weak knockback. So here I'll have even higher damage. I'll get up to 700s. I'll get up to- oh, 747. Cool. Yeah. I think this one is slightly faster speed as well, as you can see. Um, it- it doesn't show that there, but on the trailer wiki, it probably is- changes by decimal points, like with a lot of the other swords. Or just slight changes that makes it look faster. Because this- Maybe just maybe this just has a slower animation. I don't know. It could be like with lead short sword, silver short sword. But um, on that note, that's all there is for the um, my guide to Traria pre hard mode swords. Everything that you need to know. And. I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope you found it very helpful, and please give me any suggestions you may have on how to, on how I can improve these videos, as I do intend to make many more of these in the future. I spent a lot of time making this, so I appreciate it if you, it would, I would, I, I, I want to know what you think. And, um, Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you have not already. It helps me out a lot. And I will see you next time. Goodbye. Have a good day.